Hey, it's StoryWorthy. Today on the show, writer, producer, and author Bruce Ferber talks about his school project. My project was I was going to do like Eskimos, you know, with an igloo and snow, and I thought that was cool. The main ingredient in a diorama about Eskimos is snow. So my idea, my idea was cotton balls. My parents were not home at the time. So I, I went to get the cotton out of her closet and I go and I, and I take it out of her closet and I start breaking it apart for the igloo. And it is a, it's a sanitary napkin. Today on the show, writer, producer, and author of the brand new book, I Bury Paul, Bruce Ferber talks about his school project. Stay close. Hey, it's Bruce Ferber, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show of over 12 years, or you're a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. I hope you guys had a chance to listen to comedian and model Mario Adrian last week. He told a story about getting circumcised at 19, which is insane. And it's a really interesting story. He's from Germany. Nobody's circumcised over there, Bruce. Did you know that? Uh, well, I knew. Well, probably a few Jews are circumcised. <laughs> other than that. Yeah. So what happened was, I, and you guys got to go back and listen to the story, but let me give you the upshot. He was hanging out with a girl, a girlfriend who was Muslim, and he went to a wedding with her, and he stood next to her dad in the urinal, like in the bathroom, and his, and her father noticed that he wasn't circumcised, and the shit kind of hit the fan. And then anyway, you know, he made it happen. He got circumcised. And where is the girl? Gone. Oh, God. Anyway, go back, you guys. Listen to Mario Adrian. He's just a great guy, and you're going to love the story, but not today. Stick around now, because today I'm here with writer, author, and producer Bruce Ferber, and he brings forth the topic, My School Project, which is a very clean topic. I love the topic right off the bat, because everybody knows or has had a school project in their life, you know, so I'm very anxious to hear this. Um, I know when I was in high school, I took wood shop for four years, like all four years of high school, which was unique at that time for a girl. And um, I made a lot of projects. Yeah, well, that's something that that, that you, you have to do in school. And yeah. uh, and I was absolutely terrible at wood, wood shop. <laughs> um, but the story that I want to tell you is way, way, way before wood, wood shop. Oh, good. It is an elementary school. Project. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Well, we remember all these things. You know, you'd, you'd use like the ice cream sticks or you'd make a volcano and, and, and all this stuff. So what this story involves, it involves the school project and involves... You know, when you snoop into your parents' closets and they tell you what something is and, you know, you just you just take it at face value and, and all this kind of stuff. Well, I can't wait to hear about it. Now, okay. don't don't tell me about that yet, because first I want to talk a little bit about you as a television writer and a showrunner. You know, you did work on I know you've gone through this with other people and I don't mean to rehash it, but it is of interest that you were the showrunner on Sabrina, the Teenage Witch and right. Home Improvement. Right. That is and correct. specifically Home Improvement. That was a big, big hit. It was a huge hit. And uh, what's unbelievable is that, I mean, it, you know, some of these shows like Seinfeld, Frasier, you know, all, all of them are like this. But we just the show just got picked up uh, for streaming by Hulu for another six years. OK, so we went off the air in ninety nine. OK, so um, <laughs> this six is years from now is is twenty twenty eight. So it will be like 26 years. years. I mean, it's like, it's crazy. 23 years it's been off the air. 
and somebody's going to get residual checks, right? I mean, you get yeah. some of that, not a lot. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. It yeah. goes down over the years. Is that true? That is true. That is true. But isn't that exciting just to know that, you know, because so often people say they prefer film because it's more of like a project and it stands alone and it's one entity, whereas right. TV, you know, it just keeps going and it's, but then look at you, you get this thing comes back. So how incredible to see your art again right there. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I don't watch it again. I mean, I, I never watch it, but just knowing it's out there. Absolutely. And, uh, it is great. You know, I mean, because it's so far in the past for me. Yeah. That I, I don't go back and, 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 you know, if I happen to catch an episode on, it, it, it's sort of, it, it's, it's fun because I have to place, well, where was I? Was I, was, was I running the show then or was I not running the show then? And that sort of thing. But, sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm still in touch with some of the people from the show, and it's really interesting to see how people have gone off and done different things, and it's just been cool. It's unbelievable. You see, yeah. Tim Allen, I mean, my gosh, his career just, like, just took off, I mean, to the stratosphere after yeah. that show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just amazing. And then you even see now, like, that um, Hulu special, or maybe it's Netflix, about uh, Tommy and Pam, or Pam and Tommy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to think that that was Pam, and she was so young and just so fresh. Yep, that's yeah. true. That is true. Very interesting. Now, since you've been a showrunner and writing on television, since then you've started to write a lot of novels, which is yeah. very interesting. I mean, I know a lot of um, a lot of comedians, I've known showrunners, to go on and write nonfiction. But then to absolutely create a different world, right. I find that so interesting and compelling. And I know Peter Melman has done the same. And you said that Peter Melman grew up in your building? That is true. Uh, in Queens, <laughs> New York, uh, Fresh Meadows specifically. Uh, his apartment was on one floor. Mine was on the other. Uh, when I was five or six, my parents moved to Long Island. His parents stayed in Queens where he grew up and uh, yeah, and his brother was my best buddy for when, when I was a kid. And his brother used to beat me up all the time. Um, <laughs> but but I had the psychological advantage because um, I would then say to the guy, well, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. And it would drive him insane. The, the thought of me not being his friend. anymore. <laughs> Kids um, are so cruel. <laughs> Well, yeah, but then again, I was the one getting beaten up, so I, I had to have some kind of advantage there. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I knew that I could taunt him, like it, it would make him cry that I wouldn't be his friend anymore. So. It's just so interesting <laughs> where everybody comes from, and especially these places in New York. I don't know, there seems to be such a, a huge group of people here in L.A. from New York. I mean, and Boston and everywhere else, but it's just it's just funny. You know, yeah. look at that. Peter Melman goes on to Seinfeld and you go on to your shows. And uh, I think it's fascinating. Anyway, he also writes novels and he's been on Story Worthy a few times. And his novels, his novels, I've because I read your latest novel. I just read yeah. the latest novel. And his novels somewhat are, or not somewhat, they are very similar to yours. You both can pack a tremendous amount of words in a small space. Right. Like, I can feel the weight of all of the words in your book. Uh -huh. And I sometimes read the sentences over again because it's just so, um, they're so good. Now, the most recent book that you just put out called I Buried Paul, yeah. it's such a great concept. All Everything about this book I love so much. Again, it is fiction, but basically it's about a guy who plays a regular gig in a Beatles tribute band. Right. So it's not a cover band, it's a tribute band and they make the you make the discern, you know, you you make right. the you show us what the difference between those two are. Right. But basically it's about this guy Jimmy Kowalski and right. he is getting older, he's in his 50s and you know, he still has the dream. He still wants to be creative. He wants to get out there and he wants to try to get satisfied. So what else is there? This is all he knows right. is music. So right. he just stays with it and he tries to be the best he can at it. 
Right. And um, it's so, oh my gosh, your writing is so packed. If I may, I want to read this one um, little scene. And basically, I think it's Jimmy. He is with his cat. And he says, uh, like his namesake, the bass player Pastorius. Who is that, by the way? Marco Pastorius. He played with Weather Report, and he was a world-renowned, uh, fantastic bass player who died young, of course. He played with Joni Mitchell for a while when she did her, her jazz thing. Okay, Jocko so, I mean, Pastorius. Jocko, I got yeah, it. Jocko, it Jocko. was named after Jocko, the bass player. Okay, so now the character's talking about his cat. Right. And and Jimmy says, Jocko can be an asshole at times, but that holds true of everyone I've ever lived with. In the grand scheme of things, I've had litter box turds kicked across my floor fewer times than I've had my wallet emptied for Coke money. <laughs> <laughs> and tonight, the little bugger is golden, his purrs seeping into my brain like melatonin. I can feel my eyes start to close and I'm prepared to fall asleep in my T-shirt and jeans rather than disturb the blessed calm. Like, that is a beautiful paragraph. Thank you. Really, Bruce. So the whole book is like that. Every chapter, every paragraph, you pack a lot in, and I can really feel where we're at. Now, this is also a book about music and going to clubs and stuff, which I don't do as much as I used to, but I am a big fan of live music. Right. Um, like, in fact, at one point in the book, they talk about how the musicians have a big problem with DJs because, you know, DJs would be like the antithesis of a musician, which made right. me laugh. They were the ones who started putting them out of business. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It makes me laugh. So um, I found that very funny. And then you get a great blurb from Jason Alexander talking of the sound uh, back, back right. to back to Seinfeld. But he says, reading Bruce Ferber's latest novel is like being told a great tale from your favorite and funniest pal. The one who really seems to know his stuff. The one you can trust. The one who gets you when nobody else does. Long live Paul. Jason Alexander. And it's so true because it's like in this story, as you're telling us this story, it does feel like you're the older brother. I guess you sound like Gene, the older brother in the story, you know, right. kind of kind of yeah, sharing. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, just fantastic. And then you also got a great review from John Densmore, which, of course, right. was from The Doors. And he's written a great bestselling author called Riders on the Storm. And he right. says, uh, Bruce Ferber's prose is music to my ears. I Buried Paul is very funny and very insightful. So that was very cool that he said that about um, about I Bury Paul as well. You guys can find I Bury Paul anywhere, of course, that you find your books. So keep that in mind. So I just wanted to, we're going to get to your other story right away here, but I just wanted to okay. talk to you a little bit about I Bury, Bury Paul. Tell me something else about it. Just tell me something else about the process. And had you had that idea in your head for a while? And are okay. you a musician? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, you know, sort of a middle of the road musician who mm -hmm. plays, I play some guitar, some keyboards, some banjo. Ooh. But I've always been like very into music. And um, when I moved to L.A., somehow I met a lot of like really talented musicians. And like the many talented writers I know, it's not always easy to make a living at d doing this stuff. And in L.A., as getting to know these people, I could not believe the level of talent. Oh, yeah. It's here. And and just that these guys were scraping to to you know to get a studio gig or this or that, and it was just kind of mind blowing to me. And I wanted to, you know, I'm always interested in people who are willing to give it all for their art, whether it be writing or or painting or or music or podcasting. And yeah, and then and podcasting. <laughs> and then um, once once this whole thing happened where um, you could no longer make money off records and, and CDs and, you know, it was all streaming and Spotify, you know, took the, the life out of the whole thing. Um, where did that leave everybody? It left the musicians having to play live and having to get those gigs, right? And sell so, merch. Yeah, so and sell merch, exactly. So, um, you know, I always had this idea that I wanted to write about one of these musician characters. And then um, about 10 years ago, I went back east for a wedding 
And I saw that on that particular weekend, some guy that I went to high school with was playing with his Beatles tribute band in in, in a public park. And, you know, they wore the, the suits and all this stuff. And, and they, were, they were pretty good. This was probably even 15 years ago before the, the tribute band craze really exploded. So I went to see these guys and I thought, yeah, they, you know, they're pretty good. This is fun. And then... Uh, right around like the intermission, I saw they had a van parked uh, right next to the stage where they got into like their Sergeant Pepper suits or something like that. <laughs> and, you know, these guys were like, you know, pushing 60 or 50 something and they're dressing like the Beatles at 25. And I thought this was hilarious. So um, those two ideas kind of merged, wanting to do the struggling artist at 50 and what is he willing to give up for his art? And the comedy of the Beatles tribute thing. Yeah. So, um, so that's how I made Jimmy. That one of his gigs is he plays Paul McCartney in a Beatles tribute band, and uh, you know he's been playing in this Beatles tribute band ten years longer than the Beatles were together. So. <laughs> I swear I was just going to bring that up. It's a great line in the book where he, when he realizes I've been doing this longer than the Beatles did. Right. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It is. It's such a great idea. So you went to that guy's gig in the park. Yes. Yeah. And And then it's so funny because, so I went to his gig in the park and then I had this idea. Wait, did you talk to him? I want to know if you guys talked and stuff. We've talk, we talked afterward. Okay. I, I just didn't want to like have anything, anything affect me. I just wanted to do it. And when I did it, um, I kind of knew that he would be cool with me making fun of the boots and suits as long as I was respectful to the Beatles music, which I was. And so the, the great part about it was is that I was telling this story about, you know, going back and, and seeing them and stuff to somebody – who does a Beatles podcast. And he said, do you think you could get Joe to be on the show with us? I said, I think so. So it was just a whole great thing where, you know, I was talking about the book. He was talking about his Beatles tribute band. It, it, it was great. So fun. Oh, man, I'm so glad that happened. And uh, <laughs> he remembered you from high school or was it grade school? It, well, we went to grade school together, too. But he, yeah. But in high school, he played in rock bands and I did, too. And, you know, but see, I I understand that, you know, because I I'm in my 50s now and I'm still podcasting. I'm a comedian. Sure. I'm still doing it. And I have definitely sacrificed the garage, the driveway, the house, the right. washer dryer. Just cut me off any time. The water. <laughs> no, but, you know, you, you do. You weigh it out. You know, what is more important? And sooner or later, you decide you know, what what route you want to go. It's not that I couldn't have those things, but I couldn't right. have them here. So then you have to decide, okay, right. what's more important? And I totally, totally respect anybody who's older pushing on with their art, no matter what that art is. You know, I, I find it so respectable, so respectful, respectful, yes, respectable. <laughs> No, but I'm just saying, like, and uh, and I also remember one time, this is years ago, obviously, but Jackie Kennedy told her son, John F. Kennedy Jr., um, I think she probably just called him John. She said, why are you going out with Daryl Hannah? She's just a simple actress or something like that. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I would never think that. Right, right. Well, that was, you know, coming from a different, different world you I know. know i know i'm just money, saying you know <laughs> I, I know i know i know but i'm just saying that is kind of a very gr- i think it's a great analogy of yeah. of the whole yeah. idea you know how do you want to live oh well if you have to have that beautiful house well then you won't live here or whatever it's interesting absolutely um, all right, you guys. So we're going to get over to Bruce's story right now. But before we do, I wanted to mention that my other show, My Life in Three Songs, I think you would really dig my new podcast, Bruce. It is on Spotify exclusively because we do listen to the songs that the comedians bring to the table. My Life in Three Songs focuses on three songs that have impacted the comedian's life. So I've had on 
Greg Proops. I have coming up Blanca Patch, Todd Glass, Alon- Alonzo Bowden, and Pat Oswalt are all coming on the show. And they tell me the three songs that have impacted their lives and songs that paint a picture of maybe where they were. So not necessarily the artist's favorite, the comic's favorite song, but a song that takes them back to a place in time. So I've been getting some amazing music coming in, and we are having such a good time. So please, you guys, check out my Life in Three songs exclusively on Spotify. I would really appreciate it. All right, you guys, he's here right now. You hear him talking, Bruce Ferber. He is a writer, a showrunner, which you were, like I said, a showrunner on many sitcoms, and also a novelist. Like I said, you've written four books. The first book was called Cascade Falls. Can you just tell me what that was about? That was the second book. Cascade Falls was uh, was also, it was about a guy who had come to Hollywood to be a writer, and he do- he doesn't succeed, and he goes back to work for his father's a real estate development company in Arizona in a, in a, in a, and they build these communities, these planned communities in the desert. Uh, one of which is called Cascade Falls, which has no water in it. And every street is named after a waterway. And um, <laughs> that was my second novel. Actually. Okay. Wait, but what was the first one then? This one was Elevating, Elevating Overman. Overman. That was the one that Jason Alexander did the audiobook for. I saw that. And Jason Alexander, yeah, he did the audiobook for that. I read that. And that one, Elevating Overman, is about a guy who gets LASIK surgery and then his life yeah. changes. I got LASIK right. surgery. What is what, what? What happened with his life? Did he start seeing things? Tell me. Right. He started seeing not only more clearly, but he started seeing the world differently. Ah. And once he started seeing the world differently, it changed his whole personality and it, it empowered him because he was seeing things he couldn't see before. Okay. Okay. I got to go back and, and listen to that. I'd and love it, to listen it, to it. Yeah. His best friend, it, you know, because the character Overman spent his whole life being kind of a schlub. And that once he starts to see the world a little differently, he, he becomes more empowered. And his friend can't believe that his schlepper friend, uh, you know, is, is now like, you know, a real guy. And he's he's convinced that his friend is a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful movie is what that yeah, sounds well, like. Jason and I were developing it. And, you know, first is a movie, then it's a uh, Netflix series. And, you know, we, we only got in the door at one place and um, and it didn't go, but um, it would be it would be great. Damn. Be great. Damn. So, it's it's so hard for me to believe and for anybody to believe that with your credits, your successes, your talent, and then you put Jason Alexander on top of that and then you have this fantastic idea and it still doesn't go. It's just, it's hard to believe. It, I mean, it's so common. I know. So common I know. Of, you know, it, it, a lot of it is, I have to say, ageist because the people behind the desks are all young. They're buying from sure. their young friends. And um, it is what it is. You know, people like me, I mean, I'm lucky that I had such a good run and in television. And while I agree with you, I think it would make a great, you know, movie or TV series, I, I don't even have the stomach to deal with these people anymore. I know. I know. You know, it, it's just too hard. It's I too know. Hard. I know. It's frustrating. It's so frustrating. Ay, ay, ay. All right, let's move on from that. Or I start thinking and then I could just spin off. So forget it. You also worked on a book called The Way We Work on the Job in Hollywood. Now, you edited that book? Right. That's a nonfiction book. And it's just stories of people who came to Hollywood, how they made their way, um, and or, and not necessarily how they made their way, but stories that are insightful about Hollywood. And um, Oh, I'm going to get yeah. that for my kid. My kid is uh, 15 and in film school, already uh, in film school, and I think that would be a wonderful book for them. They'd love this that. This runs the gamut. I have every, everybody from, like, Robert Town to uh, to the wardrobe person to, to a production. You know, yeah. it, it's like... The whole gamut of what you can do. An editor. All the crafts. Uh, all the crafts. Yeah. That's really fun. I, I, I have one essay about my 
experience breaking into sitcoms and, you know. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, you guys. And Bruce's latest book, I Bury Paul, is now available everywhere. And I'm telling you, it is really terrific. You guys can find out more about Bruce over at his website, BruceFerber.net, which, by the way, I love the, the, the first image on your website is great. That young guy in the sand yeah, with, uh, a, with a typewriter. Yeah, that was cool. Those were the days. That was a great shot. And you guys can also follow Bruce over there on Twitter at B-R-U-U-U-C-E. So Bruce F. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the very talented Bruce Ferber. Thank you. Thank you for all those applause. So I'm going to tell a story that I've never really told before. I must have mentioned it in passing to a couple of people. But it, it is unusual in that it combines, uh, you know, I, I, it's an elementary, sc- it's a school project story from elementary school. And it combines having to make a school project with the things in your house that you, your parents tell you what they are and you believe them at, at face value. Um, so, uh, you know, Kids in, the, in this grade were making things out of ice cream sticks or whatever. So the project is was one that I, I think elementary school kids still do. Do you remember something called the diorama? Yeah. Do you remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah. So I, I don't know if kids still do it because everything. Yeah, my kid did it. They still do it. Okay. So mm-hmm. a diorama is a project made with actual materials like ice cream sticks, like whatever is around the house, string or whatever. And, and the whole idea is to create a scene. So you're, you're like a set designer, only you're building it in a shoebox or something mm-hmm, like that. Right. right? So um, my project was, I was going to do like Eskimos, you know, with an igloo and snow. And I thought that was cool. So um, I start assembling whatever whatever I need to do. You know, maybe I get some sticks from the backyard or whatever. But the main ingredient in a diorama about Eskimos is snow. So what would you what would you think you would use for snow? Um, I would use potato flakes, like in the Brady Bunch. Okay. Oh no, that was corn flakes. <laughs> so my idea. My idea was cotton balls. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fluffy, sure. snow, yeah. whatever. Right. So I had to get some cotton balls. My parents were not home at the time. And my mother had once told me that something that she had in her closet was cotton. So I went to her closet because I couldn't find any cotton balls. So I, I went to get the cotton out of her closet and I go and I, and I take it out of her closet and I start breaking it apart for the igloo. And it is a, it's a sanitary napkin. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, don't ask me what I did with the string. Uh, wait, it was a tampon or a, san- or a nap or a pad? It was a pad. So I, it was a pad. So I had a lot to work with. I, you know, I, I could break it apart, but it wasn't exactly the fluffiest cotton you, you, you could find. Um, but so a sanitary napkin became my igloo and part of my project for my diorama. So my mother comes home and she sees this thing and she says, what did you do? What did you do? I said, well, I just took your cotton and I made my, you know, I made my thing. And, and I, I cannot tell you when I actually learned what it was that I did, but, oh. but I did make a diorama out of a sanitary napkin. And the moral of this story is use what you have, <laughs> uh, be resourceful. And, you know, if your parents are not going to tell you the truth, you, you got you to gotta use what they, what they tell you. That is so <laughs> funny. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a brother, yeah. And was he older or younger? He, he was six years younger, so he was completely oh. out of the sanitary napkin loop at that point. Yeah. <laughs> he, ha- he was no resource to you whatsoever. None at all. None at all. Yeah, nothing at all could help you with that. That is so funny. Did your parents often tell you that story, like growing up, would they repeat it? I don't think they even... I mean, that story was just 
it was not even men- ever mentioned. I, I had to like, uh, um, can, can I tell you another story? Yeah. <laughs> One of the greatest I love stories this. ever. Okay. Also from okay. my childhood. This was a great story. This was after, after, and, and it, 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 it defines a certain type of humor, the humor that I grew up with, which is Jewish humor. And, and this is my parents being my parents, you know, not thinking any of this is funny. Okay. So sometime after I moved out here to California, New York had a big blackout Mm -hmm. um, and they had no power. It was the middle of winter. Right. Wow. And um, so, you know, I would speak to them by phone. They still had phone service because they had airlines. Right. And I said, how are you doing? And, you know, with the blackout, I said, we're sitting here in the kitchen. It's very cold. Your father is in a ski parker, and I am wearing my mink coat. <laughs> so, so, I, so I'm picturing them, you know, sure. like this in the house. And so my mother, whose name was B, she had a sister named Sylvia who lived a little further out on Long Island. And I said to my mother, I said, well, does Sylvia have power? She said, yes, she has power. I said, well, did she invite you to stay with them? My mother says, yes, she invited us, but she didn't insist. Oh, so they were God. just going to sit there. With their oh, my God. Because <laughs> I, my aunt didn't go the extra mile and say, I insist you come here. That is so funny. I cannot believe it. That is unbelievable. Okay, there is another guy who's been on my show. Maybe you know him. Um, his name is Barry Sonnenfeld. I know, yeah. He's yeah, a famous he DP. That. I know he wrote the book about his crazy dream. His mother, yeah. right. It, it, it was about calling, yeah, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, you know. Uh, your your, mother, it was like that. Yeah, your mother. And that was because he was in Madison Square Garden with his friends, and it was like one in the morning, and the band had just come on or something. Anyway, right before the band comes on, it gets quiet, and then over the speaker comes Barry so- Sonnenfeld, your mother's on the phone, or something like that. That is, that is really hard to believe. But I, and I, his book is so funny. Yeah. What a talented man! Also, he worked a lot, of course, with the uh, Cohen brothers, right. and uh, he had some great stories. But again, it was that Jewish household of worry, of complete worry. So um, my boyfriend is Jewish, and I just mentioned, and I told this story on Story Worthy a few weeks ago, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, my boyfriend, his daughter, she's like 24, she went off to Bali for two weeks with a friend, with a girlfriend. And all of a sudden, my boyfriend was getting his passport in the mail. And I said, oh, my God, I've been asking you to get your passport for years. Why are you getting it now? And he goes, because if my daughter gets kidnapped in Bali, I need to go over there and find her. <laughs> God, that is, that is so Jewish, yeah. It's so Jewish. And then recently, Howard Stern's father passed away. And I don't know if you're a Howard Stern fan. I was but, um, in the early days, yeah. He's really great now. He's better than ever because his everything, you know, his interviews got more serious and stuff. And he's very insightful. But uh, he's been going through some stories. <laughs> it's just so funny. Yeah. Do you miss New York? I do. I'm, I'm going back on Friday. For, oh, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do. But I, I'm, I've lived out of here for so long. You know, if I lived in New York, I would I would not live in Manhattan without having a place to escape to because I, yeah. I couldn't deal with the noise as my only option. You know, right. Right. The perfect situation is to have that place. What do people have places either in Connecticut or Woodstock, yeah, what, you know, that, that Woods, area. what is the Hamptons? What does that mean? The Hamptons is way out on Long Island. It's. The beautiful beaches. It's it's totally rich now. Nobody can afford to live there. It, I see. It's like uh, the Malibu of of mm. Long Island. I um, see. I see. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, yeah, I bet. I bet. But yeah, the idea of just being out uh, in New York without a car and you don't even know. Let's say you don't even know anybody with a house, and you're just stuck there. It's perfect. I think if you're. 18 to 25. Exactly. <laughs> I would love my kid to go to NYU just to get. Yeah, I went. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 And did you go for film or what? Film and TV. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Interesting. I could have thought maybe creative writing. No, I mean, it, it's like I didn't really know that. I, I kind of thought that was what I wanted to do early on. And then I wound up. So I was an English major. And then I wound up not being happy where I was in a small liberal arts college. And I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I knew some people who were at NYU film school. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Yeah. And then I got all involved in film and all that stuff. And What got you to L.A.? What was the first thing? Um, let's see. I was in New York. I was editing, assistant editing on a documentary. And then that was over. And then my dad, who was publisher of Esquire at the time, he took a business trip out here. And um, on that business trip, he, we were, I was staying with him at the Beverly Wiltshire Hotel. So my dad had a friend whose son was directing a movie, and he said, why don't you call this guy? And so I called the guy, and he was really friendly, and he said, yeah, I'm making a movie next week, or you know, starting in a, in a week or two or something like that. And he said, why don't you come and meet me and my sister? She's working on the movie, and you know, come have dinner with us. It was the nicest thing ever. So I meet them at the Magic Pan in Beverly Hills, and the director's name is Paul Bartell, and he's working for Roger Corman, and he's doing this movie called Death Race 2000. And he says, you know, if you want a job as a production assistant, I'll hire you. Um, but, you, you know, it starts in like a week and a half. you got to have a car, and I won't pay you anything. And I go, sounds good. I just have to get the car. So, <laughs> so I got a car for, yeah. you know, like $750, and I stayed on somebody's couch, and I was a production assistant on Death Race 2000, and that's how I – and I never went back to New York after that. Unbelievable. That's that's a great story. That is a classic Hollywood story, and then it's just yeah. one thing leads to the other, and you keep on going. Yeah, there's no other way. I, You know, I'm still going, and, and, and even between years, you know, there's right. years where nothing happens, and you feel like, am I even in this business anymore since I haven't produced anything or nothing is out there? But then something comes along, and right. then it keeps yeah. on going. I like yeah. this lifestyle. It's uh, It's... It's interesting, that's for sure. Every day is a little different. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been so fun, Bruce. I'm really happy to talk with you, and it's fun following you on Twitter. Well, I'm not that great a tweeter, so, you know, I, I'm not that great a social media person. Um, but I try and... Well, you're good with words. I mean, Twitter is a natural you know, but fit. I, but, I, but I don't necessarily have the, you know... I don't have the stomach for it because hmm. get on these social media platforms, especially Twitter. Twitter is hate is hate central. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who are you following? I mean, it depends on what you're following. I guess you I create follow, your world. I guess I follow a lot of politics, and even the, I do. The co comedians I follow are political. So I know it's tough. I know what you're saying, but if you ha if you if you only f yeah, I know what you're saying. I, it, it's a fine line, but if you see something that is really making your stomach sick then just unfollow that you know what i mean yeah, yeah i gotta unfollow it like every <laughs> <laughs> i hear you man i hear you well this has been just great you guys remember you can get i buried paul anywhere you find your books by bruce ferber just a great book i mean really good and i highly recommend that you check out some of peter melman's stuff as well bruce you'll love it he's can i just say one more thing yeah, I have a Iberry Paul Spotify page. Which, oh, the, the thing about this is, after I wrote the book, there are so as you know, there are so many song references in the book, and I thought it would be really interesting to put together a playlist of every single song that is mentioned in the book. So I went back and I did this, and it is the most bizarre playlist you'll ever see because it has everything. From the Dead Kennedys, Too Drunk to Fuck, to the Dreidel song, uh, and Mandy. So I, I mean, it, it, it's the craziest playlist, and but it all that makes, is so fun. It all makes well, sense. Yeah, well, those songs because it's in the book. There are other cover. There are other tribute bands like a tribute Barry Manilow right. or tribute. What and those are the ones that would fit in. That's a great idea. So again, on Spotify, you just look for I Barry, I Barry Paul. That's a great idea. The I Barry Paul playlist. I'm getting that immediately. Really. That's awesome. That's really good. All right. And I'll look for your new thing. 
please do. My Life in Three Songs, you guys, exclusively okay. on Spotify. You can also find it on social media at My Life in Three Songs. All right, you guys, one more time on behalf of the very talented Bruce Ferber. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Oh